as I'm sure you are aware, next Sunday is Resurrection Day. And we call it, or I call it Resurrection Day. I think that uh, designates and, and clarifies who and what we're celebrating because we're, we're celebrating the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Arguably, Resurrection Day is the most important day we celebrate because the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the validation that everything Jesus claimed to be, everything that he claimed in the scriptures is true. We serve the risen Savior who is alive and who's active in our lives. So be sure to invite some people to come with you next week and celebrate the risen Messiah, Jesus Christ. As many of you know, in Jesus' day, the, the Jews were ruled by the, the Roman Empire. And most Jews, they hated the Roman rule. They looked forward to the day when someone would come and set them free from the Roman government. And, and some people thought they knew the solution to their oppression. Uh, many people wanted uh, the sovereignty of the Israel uh, as, a, as a nation reestablished. They, they wanted a Jewish king from the line of David. They didn't want the puppet rulers that Rome kept setting up that the Roman Empire had put there. They didn't like paying taxes, especially to support the Roman Empire. They had experienced many insurrections, many unsuccessful rebellions, and, and they wanted a true savior, a messiah, to wage war against the, the oppressors. Some people even thought that Jesus of Nazareth was just the man for the job. Because think about this. Think about what they had seen Jesus do. Think about what they must have dreamed that he could do as their earthly king. He could feed the masses, right? Five loaves, two fishes. He could feed 5,000 men. He could feed the masses with so little resources. He, he could heal the sick. He could heal the broken, the diseased. He could walk on water. And he could cause other people to walk on water as well. He could command demons. He, he could raise the dead. You see, Jesus could be a, a super king. He could make the nation of Israel the world's superpower. His army would be unstoppable. They would be always supplied. They would be fearless. And, and Jerusalem would be the capital. The Jewish nation would prosper. You see, they wanted to make Israel great again. Um, there, one of, there was actually a group of people who were called the Zealots. One of the uh, Zealots was actually one of Jesus' disciples. His name was Simon, not Peter. They would have been the ones in the mega hats, you know, make Israel great again. That, that would have been them. That's what they were all about. They thought this was their guy. And it was during this time of great nationalistic fervor, the week of Passover. It would be like celebrating our Independence Day. It was Passover. And Jesus rode into Jerusalem. John chapter 12 and verse 12. Let me, we're going to read this. A passage of scripture, John chapter 12, verses 12 through 19, reading about the triumphal entry. It says, The next day, when a large crowd had come to the festival, they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him. They kept shouting, Hosanna, which, oh, save, Lord, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it was written. Do not be afraid, daughter Zion. Look, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first. However, when Jesus was glorified, they remembered that these things had been written about him and that they had done these things to him. Meanwhile, the, the crowd which had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to testify. This is also why the crowd met him because they heard he had done this sign. When the Pharisees, then the Pharisees, you know, they, they didn't like Jesus very much. And they said to one another, you see, you've accomplished nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. First thing I want you to see this morning is this. Jesus is the Messiah who is the Prince of Peace. Jesus is the Messiah who is the Prince of Peace. John 12, verse 15. Do not be afraid, daughter Zion. Look, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. Don't be afraid. Don't be stressed out. Don't, don't worry. Your salvation has come. Receive the, the good tidings of great joy for everyone. Jesus is the Messiah, and he will deliver his people from their sins. And so Jesus, he, he enters in Jerusalem on this occasion on a, on a humble donkey. The donkey symbolized the meek and the gentle, gentle humble, and, and peaceful Savior, 
rather than the entrance of a conquering king. The donkey hints at what Jesus was coming to do. He, he was not coming to be a political savior. He was coming to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus was fulfilling one of the prophecies of Zechariah. It's actually found, if you want to write it down, it's in Zechariah 9 and verse 9. Jesus is the Messiah who is the Prince of Peace. And in Hebrew, the title Prince of Peace is, is two words. It's Shar Shalom. Shar Shalom. Jesus is the Shar Shalom. Shar means the one who is in charge. Shalom means rest and tranquility and wholeness and completeness. The Romans would actually borrow this word Tsar, and they became Caesar, or Caesar as we would spell it. And it became a title of the Roman emperor, just like Julius Caesar. In Russian, the czars were the rulers. They were the emperors. They were the ones who were in charge. And Jesus was the one who was in charge. Jesus is the, is the captain. He, he's the chief. He's the Lord. He is the Shar Shalom. Shalom is actually a greeting in Hebrew. Uh, when, they, when they meet, they say, Shalom means rest and, and tranquility and, and wholeness and completeness. Jesus is Shar Shalom. He is the, the captain of rest. He is the, the Lord of tranquility. He's the chief of contentment. Shalom is, is more than just, you know, that peaceful, easy feeling that you get when you're sitting on the dock of the bay watching the tide roll away. It's more than that. It's completeness. It's wholeness. It's rest. It's genuine rest. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. You see, when you remain in him, you can experience his peace. But when you step outside of his will and his ways, you lose his peace. The peace belongs to Jesus. He is the Lord. He is the captain of peace. It's his. He's the one in charge of peace. And that's why you have to be under his leadership if you want to have his peace. And does that mean that as believers that we can do anything that we want and still have peace? Well, of course not, no. Can, can, a, can a guy who claims to be a Christian get his girlfriend pregnant and then go to church and have peace? No, because he's doing something outside of the will, outside of the lordship, the leadership of, of Shalom. Can a, can a married couple get into like a big hairy fight and go ballistic and call each other names and embarrass the wallpaper and then expect to have the peace of God? Of course not, no. Why? Because they're outside of the will of the Shar Shalom. Can, can you charge up your credit cards and spend more money than you have and, and then expect to have peace? No, because you're outside of the will of the Shar Shalom. It is only when we are under the lordship of the Tsar, the one who's in charge, that we experience his peace. And the amazing thing is this. When you are under the lordship of Christ, he gives us a peace that most people can't even understand. When your private world seems to be falling apart, Jesus can give you an inward peace that goes beyond human understanding. But we need to realize this. He is the Shar Shalom. He's the captain of peace. And just as he can give peace, that same peace can be removed. It can be removed. It can be taken away. Why? Because Jesus is the Prince of Peace. And he might remove that peace to get your attention. He might make it feel like, hey, something's not right in my life because he wants you to go back to him. He wants to draw you back to him. He is the Prince of Peace. Jesus is the Shar Shalom. Jesus is the Messiah who is the Prince of Peace. But number two, Jesus is the Messiah who is the only way of salvation. The only way of salvation. Look further down in, in John chapter 12. John chapter 12 and verse 44. Jesus cries out. He cried out. The one who believes in me believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And the one who sees me sees him who sent me. I have come as light into the world so that everyone who believes in me would not remain in darkness. If anyone hears my words and does not keep them, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to what? Save the world. The one who rejects me and doesn't receive my sayings has this as his judge. The word I have spoken will judge him 
on the last day. For I have not spoken on my own, but the Father himself who sent me has given me a command to say everything I have said. And I know, this is Jesus speaking, I know that his command is what? Eternal life. So that the, so the things that I speak, I speak just as the Father has told me. So Jesus is making it very, very clear. You are either a child of the light or you're a child of darkness. E either you believe in Jesus or you don't believe in Jesus. Either you accept Jesus' teachings as truth or you reject Jesus' teachings as false. See, you can either reject or accept Jesus. John 14 and verse 6, Jesus said this, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Yo soy el camino y la verdad y la vida. The only way of salvation is through Jesus. There is no other way to life. See, perhaps you're here this morning and you've never made the decision to follow Jesus. You've never made the decision to give Jesus control of your life. And right now you're just running from one thing to the next to, to whatever makes you happy. You're just running from one relationship to the next, one, one experience to the next, one, one empty promise to the next. And you can't find happiness. You can't find peace. You, you can't find satisfaction because you're trying to find all of that away from the Shar Shalom, away from the Prince of Peace. But let me tell you, you'll never find what you're looking for. But you and Bono, you'll never find what you're looking for unless you give your life to Jesus and you place your faith in him. See, let me, let me tell you what Jesus has done for you because he loved you so much. Jesus was born of a virgin. He was born without sin. Jesus became sin for us. See, the Bible teaches us that, that you're a sinner, that, that your sin leads you to do things that are ungodly. Things that are separate, that separate you from the love of God. See, we have a, we have a sin problem inside of us. Jesus, he, he went to the cross. We sung about this this morning. Jesus went to the cross and he, and he shed his blood and, and he died. But he didn't stay dead. He, he rose from the dead. And he did all of this, all of this, because he loves you. And he wants to save you from your sin. He wants to transform you so that you can experience his goodness so that you can experience his grace. He wants to heal you and to bring peace to your life. To reject Jesus is to reject life. To delay this decision is to continue on a pathway that leads to destruction. John chapter 3 and verse 16, very familiar verse to most people. For God loved the world in this way. He gave his one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not what? Perish, will not die, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world. The world's already condemned. If he didn't come here to do that, what did he come to do? But to save the world through him. Anyone who believes in him is not condemned. But anyone who does not believe is already condemned. He does not believe in the name the one and only Son of God. See, God in His love, in His great love, gave mankind, humanity, an opportunity to escape the wrath of His judgment. Jesus came and laid down His life for us. He expressed His love for humanity and paid the price of sin through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And Romans 10, 13 promises this. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Will be saved. The word call means to appeal to. It means to make an appeal. And lost sinners who come to Jesus and make an appeal and, and, and call on his name for the forgiveness of sins, believing that he's the Christ, the Son of God, will be saved. Romans 10, 9 and 10. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. One believes with the heart, resulting in righteousness. And one confesses with the mouth, resulting in salvation. So you need to hear this this morning. The amazing grace of God is this. 
no matter how bad you've been, no matter how dark your life is, no matter how many people you've let down, when you call on the name of Jesus, he hears your prayer, he forgives your sin, and makes you brand new this morning. If you're here and you realize and you know that you need God's forgiveness of sins, you've never made the decision to trust him, realize that you're not here by accident. Will you surrender your life to God? Will you experience his forgiveness? I ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. Will you pray this prayer, expressing that you're trusting in God's ability to save you and to forgive you? Heavenly Father, pray this with me. Heavenly Father, forgive me for my sins. Make me new. I ask Jesus to be my Savior, to be the Lord of my life, first in every way. My life is not my own. I give it to you. Thank you for new life. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, we're so happy. I, I'm happy that you've prayed that prayer, that you've confessed Jesus as Lord, and, and that your life can be transformed and is transformed. So here's what I want you to do. As you begin this journey, take out that connection card that I was talking about earlier. And what I want you to do on that connection card is check that box that says that you want more information about becoming a follower of Jesus Christ. Because one of the what we're going to do is we're going to have one of the leaders here going to get in contact with you this week and talk to you more about what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. So take that connection card, check that box, and put it in the offering plate when it passes at the end of worship. I want to celebrate with you. I want to celebrate new life in Christ. Because Jesus is the Messiah, who is the Prince of Peace. Jesus is the Messiah, who is the only way of salvation. There's a third thing I want you to see this morning. Jesus is the Messiah for the whole world, for the whole world. John chapter 12, verses 19 through 21. Then the Pharisees said to one another, you see, you've accomplished nothing. Apparently, one of the things the Pharisees were trying to do before they decided to crucify him and, and, to, and to execute him, what they wanted to do is they wanted to discredit him. They wanted to make the, his message mean nothing. They thought they could just discredit him. They thought they could make him look like an idiot and a fool and, and maybe have all the zealots go after him. They thought that that's what they could do. And they said, look, no, no, you guys have accomplished nothing because look, the whole world has gone after him. Here's an interesting thing. Look at verse 20. Now some Greeks, some Greeks were among those who went up to worship at the festival. So they came to Philip who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, kind of a, a Greek area, and Philip being a Greek name. And they requested of him, look what they said, what a beautiful statement. Sir, we want to see Jesus. We want to see Jesus. Jesus es el Messiah por todo el mundo. Jesus is the Messiah for the whole world. See, obviously, the Pharisees were exaggerating when they claimed that the whole world had gone after him. But Jesus had the message, the power of the gospel. And they realized that Jesus' message was powerful. They wanted to silence it. They realized the impact and the influence that he was having. They tried to oppose it. They tried to discredit it. But nothing can silence the truth of the gospel. The, the message of Jesus Christ just had spread so much that even the Gentiles, who were Yahweh-fearing people, had come and they wanted to see Jesus. The gospel message was not going to be limited to the Jewish people. It would, thank God, spread to the Gentiles. So Jesus is the Messiah for the whole world. Look at these words of, of Christ from Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. It says this, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and in Samaria, and to the end of the earth. See, if you are believing in Jesus as your Savior, then you have the power of the Holy Spirit in you. The power of the Holy Spirit indwelling you for the specific purpose of spreading the gospel message. This power in Acts 1.8 is the same word that Jesus that was used when Jesus did his miracles. It's the same miracle-working power that's in us through the Holy Spirit's indwelling. See, if effectiveness of the gospel depends on my power, 
and my ability, um, I'm, I'm going to mess it up. But it doesn't. It's not about my power. It's not about my effectiveness. It's not about my ability or inability to speak. It's not my powers of persuasion. It's not in my theological arguments or my knowledge of the original languages or whatever it might be. It's none of that. It's the power of the Holy Spirit in me. It's the power of the Holy Spirit in you. Don't quench the Holy Spirit. Allow the Holy Spirit to work through you, to be an effective witness for Jesus Christ. One of the things um, about Acts 1.8, I'm going to put Acts 1.8 back up there for a second. One of the things that we see is these words tend to be geographical. But one of the things I want to give to you this morning as we close is instead of looking at these ideas as, as, as geographical, look at them as relational. Look at them as relational. Because Jerusalem is really talking about your primary circles of influence, your primary circles of influence. And, and for most of us, our, our primary circles of influence are going to be people like our family, going to be our friends. These, these primary circles of influence are places that you're known and, and cared for and loved. And this primary circle is the, is the first people that we spread the gospel message to. It could be the hardest people we spread the gospel message to. But our primary Circles of influence. That's our Jerusalem. Our Judea is our, is our secondary circles of influence. For many of us, our secondary circles of influence are things like work or school. Our secondary uh, circles of influence are places where you have like connections and, and common experiences, and you, and you use those things to, to spread the gospel. Samaria. Difficult people. Difficult people. I'm terming Samaria as difficult people because Samaritans were people that, that the Jews didn't like. The Samaritans they, they, and the Jews, they really didn't like each other. They, they didn't have um, perspectives on the same things. They, they worshipped in different places, and, and they were difficult. But Jesus didn't say you could ignore difficult people. Sometimes I wish he did, but he didn't. He, he said, no, they need the gospel too. And I think that all of us can think of groups of people who are difficult. In this day and time, we don't even have to look very far to find them. And I think as time marches on that we're going to find ourselves coming in confrontation with more and more difficult people who are opposed to the gospel message. But we give them the gospel just the same. And we allow the gospel to change their lives. And then the ends of the earth. The ends of the earth. Culturally different people. Culturally different people. One of the amazing things that we see around us is that through the internet and through travel, the whole world seems to be coming, and, and they're, they're here. In, in America, we, we literally don't have to go anywhere. In, in Laredo, we really don't have to go anywhere to find culturally different people. The question is, is what are we going to do to reach them, to spread the gospel message to different cultures? And so we have opportunities. We have opportunities to take the gospel message of Christ. It's our mandate to spread the gospel to our Jerusalem, to our Judea, to our Samaria, and to the ends of the world. Jesus wanted his disciples, his followers, to continue the work that he started. He wanted them to seek the lost. So here's a question I'm going to ask you this morning as we close. Are you seeking the lost? Jesus, in his triumphal entry, he came to seek and to save the lost. Are you, are you seeking the lost? Are you being obedient to the mission of Jesus Christ? To Jesus' the Messiah, who is the Shar Shalom. He, he's the Prince of Peace. Jesus is the Messiah who is the only way of salvation. And Jesus is the Messiah for the whole world. Let's go to the Lord in prayer.